And today it is my pleasure to introduce writer and journalist Alex Beam. Mr. Beam worked for Newsweek and Business Week before joining the Boston Globe in 1986. He's also a columnist for the International Herald Tribune. He has written for Atlantic Monthly, Slate, and Forbes. He was a John Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford University in 1996 and 1997. Uh, he has other books under his belt, including gr uh, Gracefully Insane and A Great Idea at the Time. And tonight he is here with his new work of nonfiction, American Crucifixion, The Murder of Joseph Smith and the Fate of Mormon Church. Mr. Beam relied on both Mormon and secular archival sources to examine one of the most fascinating moments in American history when the mob stormed the jail in Illinois and killed the founder of the Latter-day Saints movement. And in the words of one of the reviews of the book, American Crucifixion paints a brilliant picture of religious experimentation, public intolerance, and the making of a martyr. And now please welcome Alex Beam. Thank you, Anton. Thank you. For, is everyone is everyone okay for listening? A um, little louder. Okay. Um, it's so nice to see some faces here. I'm I'm actually returning to my hometown. I was born in George Washington Hospital, and um, it's lovely to be back in Washington. I wanted to especially thank uh, the two owners of politics and prose. I'm so happy I lost that set of tennis to Brad Graham in 1983 in Warsaw. It was obviously strategic because now he's um, repaying me with an appearance at his famous bookstore. Um, I know Brad partly because I've written about independent bookstores and um, it occurred to me I would have to deliver a brief encomium to um, the bookstores that are sort of keeping the flame of um, book selling alive. And I, I thought I might compare them to the, uh, the monasteries in medieval England, which were these islands of learning and scholarship in a, in a horrible, uh, ravaged countryside. And then I remembered that Henry VIII, Henry VIII actually destroyed the monasteries and seized all their property and um, threw the monks out on the, into the countryside. I'm sure we know who Henry VIII is in this particular comparison. But um, anyway, I wish, I wish politics and prose a long and happy life, much longer, in fact, than the monasteries in medieval England. Uh, there's three parts to what I'd like to do tonight. Um, I'm going to explain um, how I came to this book, which is a, a question that some people have already asked me, and I've only been here for about 10 or 15 minutes. But it's a question uh, that really interests um, uh, Mormons, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, whom I've been speaking to in, in recent days. Um, Secondly, I, I, wanna, I wanna explain all of Mormon history in about three or four minutes because it, it'll help situate uh, where this book is, why the events that are described in this book are important, both in Mormon history and in American history. And lastly, I wanna read from my book because I'm very old fashioned and I really believe that an, at an author reading, authors should read. Um, <laughs> I, I once attended a reading actually by a novelist named Jonathan D. and he was such a great writer, I bought his book on the spot. Uh, I'm not asking for that to happen here, but um, I'm very suspicious of authors who won't read at, at author readings. I mean, you know, what do they have to hide? In any case, I have nothing to hide, and I'm, I'm going to be reading um, a little bit from the book. So. I wish I wish I had. I, there is, of course, the truly incredible story that my my mother and Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon Church, do share a birthday, December twenty third. But that's not how I came to write this book. It, it's a very prosaic little tale that I'll unpack right now at, at a at a bad moment in my life. In June of two thousand and eleven, I received an email from my literary agent, a, a one line email with a misspelling saying, would you like to write a book about Joseph Smith? And I was, I was utterly astonished for two reasons. <laughs> First of all, I was reasonably sure my literary agent had no idea who Joseph Smith was. So this whole thing was, was interesting and questionable at the same time. And um, secondly, I wonder, well, why did he send me this email? And I think I realized that from Midtown Manhattan, my friend Michael knew that, that I attended church, and so I think the way his whole intellectual world is Mormons, far away, strange, attend church, 
crazy beliefs, you know. <laughs> Alex, far away, attends church, possibly crazy beliefs. So anyway, I then, uh, it turned out he had had lunch with a young editor named Benjamin Adams, a, a really intelligent guy who works at the same publishing house where the co-owner of this store has published two books, uh, Public Affairs, um, two books by Brad Graham, two books by Alex Beam. Um, this young guy uh, had an idea for a book, and he, he thought there would be an interesting and compelling work of popular history to be written about the, the murder, the killing of Joseph Smith. And here are the reasons he thought it would be an interesting book. It was about religion, which is an inherently interesting subject. It was about a new religion on the American continent in 1844. It's a very violent story, obviously. Uh, some of you may or may not know, I mean, Joseph Smith is murdered essentially in cold blood by, a, by an angry mob. It's a violent incident that takes place on the American frontier, which I certainly wouldn't have known until I started researching the book. Um, the settled United States ended at the Mississippi River when Joseph Smith decided to found his colony of Nauvoo in far southwestern Illinois. Uh, there, there was no state to the west of where he settled his colony. There was the Iowa Territory. Missouri was to the west, but it wasn't across from where Smith was. So Smith had moved his people, sort of his nation, as far away from po as possible from the seat of American power. And I'll get to that when I resume all of, Ameri uh, all of Mormon history in, in four minutes. But it, it, it was a, a, ver a wild and lawless area. Of course, you don't think of Illinois that way. But, but this, was, this was the far reaches of the United States. Um, they just, you know, Abraham Lincoln fought the Indians there in 1830. Um, it, was, it was a wild place. Another reason uh, that I don't think we try to hide from anyone uh, that Ben was interested in, in this book being written was because there's sex in it. There's, um, polygamy is a, bi is a big deal in this book. It was a big deal in the, in the life of Joseph Smith in 1843 and 1844 which are essentially the years that are covered here. And polygamy is, is much more than approximate cause uh, for his killing. Um, polygamy literally, which was, it was a secret doctrine at the time. It was something that uh, I'll get to sort of how he came up with it, as it were. But it literally uh, split his church in half and, I argue, uh, cost him his life. The, the first statement is easily defensible because um, after Joseph Smith dies, the Mormon church, in fact, does split in half. And what probably most of us in this room think of as the Mormon church, the Utah church, called the Brighamites at the time because they followed Brigham Young across the river to Utah. They were the, the polygamy affirming Mormons, but there was a branch of the church, and still is in fact, that, has, that was long called the Reformed Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that stayed in Illinois um, and eventually moved to Independence, Missouri because its adherents refused to accept the doctrine of polygamy. Um, Joseph Smith's son eventually became president of that religion. Um, Joseph Smith III and his mother, Joseph Smith's first wife, um, also identified herself with that breakaway religion for many years. And um, lastly, uh, they thought this would be a good book. It turned out to be a good book, so that's okay. It was a good instinct. It's an unusual story to tell because it takes place in a very compressed piece of time, if you will. Um, ben was fond. He asked me to read a book that some of you may have read called um, Manhunt by a local author named James Swanson. It's a fascinating book. It's a good piece of popular history. It's the account of the search for John Wilkes Booth in the Virginia countryside after he kills Abraham Lincoln. And Ben correctly knew that this book takes place in, in a very, very compressed time frame. Um, dissidents rise up against Joseph Smith on June 7th of 1844, and he's dead on June 27th of 1844. So his life is sort of extinguished in an incredibly uh, dramatic and uh, certainly unforeseen by him series of events. The the difference between my book and, and Swanson's excellent book, Manhunt, and I, I will get back to this in a second, is I remember reading his book, and um, it, it begins with Lincoln's second inaugural book, but one of the earliest scenes is, as I recall it at least, is a stable boy 
holding uh, Wilkes's escape horse with its um, horseshoes are sort of clattering on 15th Street. I don't, I can't actually remember, obviously Wilkes is injured, so I can't remember if he escapes on the horse or not. And I was so envious of, of Swanson because of course he can start his story at a place that you've heard of. He can start at Ford's Theater with a person you've heard of, John Wilkes Booth. He can, his point of departure is an event that's familiar to everyone. I didn't have that luxury, um, not only in researching this book, but also in retelling the story, I really had to start from absolute zero. I had to assume that even the relatively well-informed reader, like myself, simply knew absolutely nothing about this subject. And it takes me a moment or two to explain you know, how Joseph Smith managed to found the largest city in Illinois in a southwestern town called Nauvoo, um, larger than Chicago at the time. It, it just takes me a moment or two to explain how 12 to 14,000 Mormons got there and eventually were chased out of there. Now, all of Mormon history. Um, but I, I'm not trying to be facetious, but I am, I'm trying to, it's complicated I'm, it, it, and I'm trying to situate where my book takes place. I, I've, never, I've never used audiovisual props, and I won't be starting now. But imagine that this is, this is Vermont, where Joseph Smith is born, as, as many of you know. Um, this is where he uh, you know, interacts, if you will, with the angel Moroni, where he gets the golden plates that become the Book of Mormon. This is where he founds, not in, excuse me, not in Vermont. Of course, he moves to Palmyra in New York. And that's where he meets at the Hill Cumorah. He meets the angel Moroni, gets the tablets that become the Book of Mormon, founds his religion in 1830. So he's moved from Vermont to, to upstate New York called the Burned Over District and begins to gather adherents largely on the strengths of, of his charismatic preaching, but also on the, due to the fact that he has brought to the world a third Bible, a third canonical Bible for his followers, for his followers, the the Bibles are the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Book of Mormon. Smith, again, uh, more, gains more people, gains adherents, gains uh, followers, and moves to Kirtland, Ohio, which is the first sort of serious, Vermont, New York, Kirtland, Ohio, the first sort of serious Mormon settlement. Um, the church is growing partly through preaching and proselytizing, but of, co of course also through aggressive missionary work the kind of aggressive missionary work that obviously continues right, right in, unto our day has always been a key part of the growth of the Mormon church. So the church is growing, and in what will be the first of a series of high, a very similar events, uh, Smith and the Mormons are chased out of Kirtland, Ohio. Um, Smith decides to start a bank, which really was not a good idea, and most of the citizens of Kirtland, Ohio lost all their money in the Mormon bank, and they took it out of the Mormons, and they chased the Mormons. Now, this is, this is the Mississippi River here. The middle is the Mississippi River. They chased the Mormons all the way to Missouri. Um, some of you either know or don't know that, um, that Missouri is absolutely key uh, place for Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon because that's where he said Jesus Christ came to visit America. He also situated um, the original Garden of Eden in Independence, Missouri. And his original Zion was deemed to be in, in Independence, Missouri. So he moved, the, his people were frankly chased out of Ohio. They move all the way here across the Mississippi to Missouri. They live in Missouri for three or four years, and uh, they're chased out again. Uh, what's called the Mormon War takes place. They're exterminated. There's an extermination order um, in, enacted by, by Missouri against the Mormons in 1839. Extermination has a different meaning in 1839 from the meaning that, that we take it today. Um, it literally means to, to chase out of your boundaries. It means that the Mormons had to leave Missouri and fast and under force. It doesn't mean they were killed, although many Mormons, in fact, were killed by angry Missourians in 1839. But they are exterminated. They are sent to the border. The border is the Mississippi River, and they're forced to go into Illinois. Now they're on the Mississippi River. This is where my book takes place, the colony of Nauvoo, 12 to 14,000 Mormons. Smith is eventually started here in Vermont, ends up in Illinois, 
he's going to be killed right here in Carthage, Illinois. And this is where the sort of the pendulum of Mormon history begins, which I, whether it's interesting or informative, I don't know, but it, it's, it's, it's worth knowing. They're exterminated again here. Smith is killed. The, 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 there's a genuine threat that many more Mormons are going to be killed. So Brigham Young, indeed, essentially negotiates the extermination of, of thousands of Mormons. He said, we will leave. And in February of 1846, he begins this incredible trek to Salt Lake City, where he takes five or 6,000 Mormons. I'm not exact numbers aren't sure, perhaps more. He takes them outside the United States. There's no United States here. We haven't yet quite completed the land grab here from, from Mexico and Spain. He takes them to the, the Great Salt Lake. And that part, you know, for all of the 19th century, he founds a, a country the size of France called Deseret in the Great Salt Lake Basin, um, becomes an amazing economic power. And again, through missionary work, uh, there's, there, there come to be just a vast Mormon presence, not only in Utah around the Great Salt Lake, but in what is now actually called the Mormon Culture Zone. I'm sure many of you understand. You know, there's a reason Harry Reid's a Mormon. There's a reason a lot of sheriffs in Arizona are Mormons. Um, Young spread the Mormon faith all, all over um, what was then called California, and, and parts of which are now called California. In any case, the pendulum I wanted to show is that the, the Mormons are simply harried, harassed, hated, and chased all the way from the East Coast really to sort of nowhere, to a desert. They're outside the United States. And that's their, I would argue, that's their entire history in the 19th century. And what's fascinating about Mormon history in the 20th century, in my opinion, of course, is that the pendulum swings back exactly differently. In, in, every, for every reason that they ostracized themselves from America in Washington, New York, whatever you want to call it, they, in the beginning in 1890 and later, of course, uh, they want to become a state, they, they abjure polygamy, and the pendulum swings back to where, of course, you know, Mormons want to gain power in, in America. The, their first senator, Smoot, um, is elected. That's a big deal. Utah gains statehood. And, and I mean, the way the pendulum swings back is, I mean, that, that you have a, a, a Mormon who was a credible president, a credible uh, candidate for presidency of the United States, which, which is, in my mind, an incredible series of events, given that they were a, a completely uh, sort of ostracized and hated group. And within 100 years, they'd swung right back to the, um, to the center of American power. And uh, in a way, the only, what really set that pendulum in motion was this, this brutal killing of the founder of their religion, the brutal killing of Joseph Smith. Now I'm going to read. I'm going to read three things um, from the book. And the, the first thing I'm going to read is a little bit about, about Joseph Smith himself. Because when I was comparing my dilemma to that of, say, writing a book about Lincoln or John Wilkes Booth, the real dilemma is um, you're starting from zero and you have to immediately come to grips with, with Joseph Smith, um, who I, you know, what, what, what can you say? He's, he's, he's uh, re regarded by, by hundreds of millions of people as a, as a charlatan and worse. Um, and um, so I, I had to figure out, you know, you know was I going to be making fun of Joseph Smith for 280 pages and sort of uh, laughing at him, uh, you know, sending up? You know his his preapic nature. You know even even the most uh, staid Mormon historians acknowledge that he had well over thirty five wives, um, probably as many as fifty. You know so th there's a serious question um, that, that that posed itself to me, and I, I'll just read you uh, a couple of passages of my own writing about Joseph Smith. When I first introduce him in the book, it's it's hardly his finest moment. He's actually trying to escape across the Mississippi. It's, it's a very biblical story. He's trying to escape his own fate. He, he realizes that he's been indicted in Carthage, Illinois. If he goes to Carthage, he'll probably be killed. So he and uh, his brother and two other Confederates get in a boat and, and escape to Iowa. So I meant they're all in a boat. This um, I, I start out in my book. Uh, the fourth man bobbing on the waves of the swollen river was 38-year-old Joseph Smith, prophet, seer, and, re and revelator, the president, 
of the high priesthood, candidate for presidency of the United States, king of the kingdom of God, commander in chief of the armies of Israel, judge, mayor, architect, recorder of deeds, postmaster, hotel operator, steamboat owner, and husband, many times over. Born in Vermont, Smith was a far cry from the stereotypical New England man of God. Quote, people coming to Nauvoo, where he lived, expected to find a, a kind of John the Baptist, but they found a very jolly prophet, a convert remembered. Quote, he used to laugh from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. It shook every beat, bit of flesh in him. He was no hair-shirted prophet. Joseph, reared on subsistence farms, scorned the pious Pharisees of the preaching profession. Quote, I love that man better who swears a stream as long as my arm and is attentive to administering to the poor and dividing his substance than the long, smooth-faced hypocrites, he told the saints in 1843. Perhaps Mormons were supposed to shun alcohol as prescribed by the revelation known as the word of wisdom, but Joseph didn't. When he heard that some of the brethren had been drinking whiskey, quote, I investigated the case, he reported. Satisfied that no evil had been done, Joseph, quote, gave them a couple of dollars with directions to replenish the bottle to stimulate them in the fatigues of their sleepless journey. I've been, um, a lot of Mormon uh, reviewers have, uh, I, I think, quite correctly said that um, I, I paint Joseph uh, t to uh, have a me megalomaniacal uh, edge to him. Um, I guess that starts on page seven because I write, if Smith indulged in megalomania, he came by it honestly. From his humble beginnings as a diviner and scryer, a person who sees miraculous occurrences through translucent seer stones, he had accomplished the work of several lifetimes. There were plenty of millenarian preachers with apocalyptic scenarios spinning their tails in northern New York's burned over district when Smith started out. Charles Finney, who became one of Smith's detractors, claimed to have entertained Jesus Christ in his law office. <laughs> the Campbellites, the Millerites, the Rappites, by 1844, they were forgotten. Quote, I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. Smith bragged to his followers just a month before this parlous river crossing, quote, a large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. Um, huge personality, I think. It's a, you can say at, um, at the very least, I was going to, uh, I'll read one more brief, Joseph kept a diary, which is a very a big deal in, in Mormon history. He didn't actually keep his diary himself. Um, he had people who kept it for him, but it's, uh, it's an invaluable uh, source of information about his life. And this is an excerpt from his diary in 1843. He spends the morning chopping wood. He's chopping wood um, with the brethren who are tithing their services to him. He says he then devotes two hours to reciting in German before he oversaw Nauvoo court proceedings in the upstairs office of his red brick store. Joseph was both mayor and chief justice in Nauvoo. There was a lawsuit to adjudicate, adjudicate that day and a theft. While supervising the court, Joseph looked out the window and spotted two boys fighting with clubs in front of a nearby tavern. Quote, and this is his journal, his own diary refers to himself in the third person. The mayor saw it and ran over immediately, his journal records. He caught one of the boys and stopped him and then he stopped the other. Joseph chided the bystanders for not breaking up the fight, and then he walked back to his store. His final message to the two young miscreants, quote, nobody is allowed to fight in this city but me. Um, I, I'm now going to, um, I have a whole chapter on, 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 on polygamy. It, it, it sort of goes without saying. Uh, it was, it's, it's almost um, in, in, infinitely interesting. Um, the part I'm going to read, I guess, is I'm going to attempt to explain how, how polygamy worked. The, um, I, I, the, the revelation about polygamy it came to Joseph, um, it, it's controversial, but it came to him in the 1830s. And, um, you know, quite, quite correctly, uh, 
Joseph's spiritual grounding, I would argue, um, and, and I'm not sure I would argue successfully, but I would argue that is really in the Old Testament. Um, the, the Mormons are, are constantly likened uh, to the, the people of the book, the Jewish people, and in the Old Testament, there are many examples of polygamy that Joseph Smith, of course, loved to talk about, and, and he claimed that God had told him that, that like the people of Abraham, um, that he, he and his followers would have to raise up seed to God and have, have many children. And polygamy began as kind of a whispered, uh, whispered secret that Joseph shared only with his, his closest and most intimate uh, followers. It was still secret at the time of his death. Polygamy uh, wasn't announced as, as a tenet to the Mormon church until they got to Utah in 1852. And it, it, was, a, it was obviously a very pernicious secret. Uh, I mean, it goes without saying. Um, every, every person, including Brigham Young, of, in, of course, including Joseph's wife, his, his, his absolutely closest uh, friends and intimate companions simply could not stomach the idea of, of, le of, of taking on another wife. It had, it had very, it, there's, a, there's a sense in which it, it had an unprurient um, overlay because Joseph was marrying his friends' wives. They had already had several children. There, there's also an element of prurience to it. I would be the first to allow. But, but I, there's no one of his followers. In, indeed, I think Joseph himself would claim that when the angel told him about polygamy, that even he himself was, was repelled. But in any event, I, I'm just going to, this is sort of a micro example uh, in the chapter. Um, it involves a woman who first meets Joseph Smith as a girl. She's 12 years old in Kirtland, Ohio, where I mentioned was one of their first colonies. And uh, she's kind of precocious as a little girl, and she's memorized a little bit of the uh, Book of Mormon. And Joseph praises her, and it's a very moving moment. And then uh, after Joseph leaves, someone, this is a 12-year-old girl, someone says, you know who was here? And the girl says, no, I have no idea. And, and, and the person says, an angel of the Lord was here. So the idea is that if Joseph comes to visit your house, he comes in the company of an angel of the Lord. In any case, I pick up this same woman's story. She's now uh, 23 years old, and, and she's married. Her name is Mary Rollins. Her, her name is Mary Rollins Leitner, her married name. And I'll just, this will sort of show how polygamy works, if you will. In 1839, Mary, her husband, and their two young children had fled Missouri and settled not far from Nauvoo, the colony in Illinois. Her husband suffered business reverses and had trouble earning a living. Mary taught art to young children, including to Joseph Smith's adopted daughter, Julia. She was living in, her, in a tiny dwelling when Smith first asked her to marry him in early 1842. Mary was 23 years old, married, and pregnant with her third child. Joseph was 36 years old, the father of four children, and unbeknownst to Mary, and almost every other member of his church, he was husband to eight wives, including Emma, the mother of his children. Joseph explained to Mary, as he would to many other women, that an angel of the Lord had revealed the doctrine of plural marriage to him three times since 1834. Naturally, he had at first found the teaching shocking and repugnant. On the final visit, the angel, brandishing a sword, quote, said, I was to obey that principle or he would slay me. So Joseph Smith testifies that, that he adopted polygamy only a after a sword-wielding angel f forced him to do this. Joseph told Mary, 23-year-old Mary, that the two of them had already been together, that, quote, I was, this is Mary's recollection, that, quote, I was created for him before the foundation of the earth was laid. He further, now Alex, he further explained and he would repeat this to many women, that God had granted him eternal life. Quote, I know that I shall be saved in the kingdom of God, he said. Quote, I have the oath of God upon it, and God cannot lie. Furthermore, his wives and children would be granted salvation with him at the end of time. Mary Rollins worshipped the prophet, but she had doubts about this new revelation. If you saw an angel, she asked, why didn't I? And how do you know the angel came from heaven? Perhaps Satan sent one of his angels. Mary said she would accept this new teaching only if an angel came to her. That will doubtless happen, Joseph said. And in the meantime, please don't repeat this conversation to anyone. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of it, Mary answered. Quote, 
I shall never tell a mortal I had such talk from a married man, unquote. Mary prayed as Joseph counseled her, and one night she reported that, quote, a personage stood in front of the bed looking at me. Its clothes were whiter than anything I had ever seen. I could look at its person, but when I saw its face so bright and more beautiful than any earthly being could be, and those eyes piercing me through and through, I could not endure it. It seemed as if I must die with fear. I fell back in bed and covered up my head. Mary shared this bedroom with her mother and her aunt, who also saw, quote, a figure in white robes pass from our bed to my mother's bed and pass out of the window. I resume writing. This was the sign, Mary concluded. In February of 1842, on the second floor of Smith's red brick general store, Brigham Young sealed Mary and Joseph as husband and wife, quote, for time and all eternity. She was told to remain married to Adam Leitner, who was out of town on business. <laughs> I, you know, and I, I, apol I apologize, uh, you know, I mean, but, but what can you say? The, the words are there. They're, they're there before me. Um, Joseph did this a lot. Uh, there's a lot of new research on polygamy. There's, there's some extremely important uh, scholarly battles going on right now. But um, this story is, is repeated. I, I think it's safe to say um, many, 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 many times in Joseph's life where, uh, in, in any case, he, 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 he generally overcomes resistance. He's rarely um, rebuffed, shall we say, by by women, and he, he marries, in a sense, two categories of people. He marries uh, married women, women who are already married to, to friends of his, and he also marries very young girls, which, which is a, gets him in terrible trouble with his wife. Uh, obviously, I'm just gonna sort of footnote one thing. When I say Brigham Young married uh, Joseph to this woman, quote, you know, for time and all eternity, um, Mormons in the audience will, will know, of course, uh, Joseph sealed himself to his many partners in two separate ways. Uh, this, is, this, this happens to be true, but it, it's subject to debate. When you're see, you can, Mormons can seal themselves to people who are not living. They can be sealed for eternity um, and are. Um, but when Joseph sealed himself to a woman for time and eternity, he intended to take her as his wife Gen and generally speaking, he meant to have conjugal relations with her, but time and eternity is a, is a, is a signal that, that he's going to have actual husband-wife relations um, with the woman in question. He does, in fact, seal himself to some women for eternity only, uh, meaning that they will share in his salvation um, at, the, at the end of the world. The last thing I'm going to read. Um, but let me, I, what I'm not going to read is, I'm just not going to read the kind of the gripping narrative that's in the middle of this book. Because um, what the heck, you read that. Um, I, it, it's, 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 a kind, it's a story that has a lot of pace. It's, it's indeed the afore referenced extremely violent story. Um, who, who are the leaders of the mob? Wh why the Mormons are hated? How they come to get Joseph? It's a very ugly story. The story of the trial is um, just a. I, 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 in my view, unbelievably fascinating. I mean, it's important to remember that, that Joseph Smith is, is gunned down uh, in cold blood, I would say. He happened to have a kind of useless derringer uh, by hundreds of people in, in broad daylight. He's gunned down at, at like 5, 12 p.m., broad daylight in a, on a summer's day. And um, the, the authorities, such as they are, like the governor of Illinois, uh, the, the Mormons are, are a super important population there. There are numerous population in Illinois, among other things. So he, he insists there will be justice for this merciless killing. Anyway, it's, it's completely, it's kind, of, it's kind of laughable, but horrific, of course, um, in another way, in that it was actually known who killed Joseph. And those people just immediately fled to the Iowa Territory and were never found. So they put sort of nine people on trial who actually didn't kill Joseph, but who probably incited, uh, they put the newspaper editor on trial, they put a bunch of rabble rousers on trial, though these were not the men who actually killed Joseph. And in this horribly farcical, uh, long court proceeding, um, marked by, by false, uh, in the sense, the, the only testimony in this long trial is false, and, it's, and, and so it has a sort of comic edge to it. But in any case, everyone walks free, of course. So no, no, you know, two people are killed in, in broad daylight, and um, there, there are no consequences whatsoever, except that the Mormons are 
are chased out of the state. Um, so it's a, it's a rough story. Um, I'm going to read the, the very final scene in my book, um, which uh, I, is, very <laughs> is very meaningful to me, I'll say. Um, and I, it's, 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 I, I'm happy I chose this as the final scene, but I'll have to set the stage a little bit. When Joseph is murdered in his jail cell, there's four people in that cell. His brother Hiram, uh, uh, important figure in the church, um, I, I believe he's the, the patriarch of the church at this time, um, and he, he killed immediately. Uh, tries to shut the door, a bullet hits him in the, uh, killed immediately. Um, his, one of his scribes and historian named Willard Richards is actually hiding, uh, that's a little bit unfair, but in any case, he's, let's say he's pinned behind the door of the jail cell and, every, and the mob is firing through the door. So Willard Richards survives with a, a bullet nick on his earlobe and there's a fourth person in the jail cell, uh, John Taylor, uh, a Canadian who's journeyed to, uh, he's an important figure in the church. And Taylor is shot four times in 1844. He's, he's bleeding profusely. He rolls under a bed and the mob kind of loses track of him. And he is a survivor of the massacre in the, in the Carthage jail. And um, he's, he's attended to the next day. You know, someone takes a, you know how you have a compass when you were in like fourth grade and has this really sharp point? The local doctor uses the point of a compass to pry the bullets out of uh, John Taylor's body. And you can, I, find, um, I find Taylor to be an interesting figure. Um, and 10 years after, to the day after Smith's killing, um, there's a ceremony at, at what is then the Tabernacle in Salt Lake City. The Mormons have moved as a group to Salt Lake City. It's not the Tabernacle that's there now. It's, a preview, it's built of adobe and on June 27th, 1854, 10 years after Joseph's death. It's a sweltering day. It's a, um, water from City Creek is passed to everyone. And there, Joseph's death is now called the martyrdom. It's, it's a holy event in the life of the Mormon church. But this is the, really the most significant celebration and since it's happened, and Brigham Young is the leader of the Mormons, and Brigham is going to open the ceremony, and he makes a little speech. What's interesting, and I, I will be reading this, is that, um, and then Taylor is invited to speak. Taylor, uh, the other guy, Willard Richards, has died. Taylor is the only survivor of the jailhouse massacre. And what's astonishing is that not only has he survived after being pumped full of lead and bleeding to death in Carthage, is that he's going to live another 35 years after 1854. He's actually going to become the president of the Mormon church, taking over from his hated rival, Brigham Young. And, I, and that, that'll be explained. But in any case, my final scene is John Taylor remembering, if, sort of, remembering what it was like to be with Joseph uh, in the jail cell on the, on the last day of his life. The featured speaker, this is in 1854 in Salt Lake City, was Apostle John Taylor, now 45 years old, Taylor's presence at the tabernacle was nothing short of miraculous. Just 10 years before, the mobbers had riddled him with bullets and left him for dead underneath a filthy mattress in the Carthage jail. He survived two impromptu operations without anesthesia. But like Mormonism itself, Taylor had not merely survived, he had prevailed. The Canadian convert had opposed Brigham's one-man rule, incurring Young's wrath for his lack of fealty. Young, Brigham Young, thought Taylor was uppity claiming that, that Taylor had said of the Quorum of the Twelve, quote, this is a really bad word here, I'm not going to say it, you know, you are my slaves and you shall black my boots. Brigham Young wanted Taylor, quote, to bow down and confess that he was not Brigham Young, something Taylor refused to do. Brigham may not have rever revered Taylor, but the saints did. On, that, on this day, he enjoyed a special status as the only survivor of the Carthage Massacre. The other guys are dead. Taylor would live 33 more years and assume the church presidency upon Brigham's death. A feisty and erudite leader, he died with a price on his head, hiding from federal deputies who were chasing down polygamists in the refractory Utah Territory. Taylor spent his last days on a farm north of Salt, Salt Lake City, quote, in the D.O., as the saints called their constantly moving underground headquarters. D.O. means on the Dodge. This was a period when the, when the Latter-day Saints were in open rebellion uh, from federal power in Washington. The last graph of the book is uh, Taylor then regaled his audience with a lengthy first-person account of the prisoners' final nights in the jailhouse. 
except for Willard Richard's curt memorandum published in the church newspaper immediately after the killings, this was the first attempt to narrate the last days of the Smith brothers in all their agonizing detail. Governor Ford's perfidy, Captain Robert Smith's double dealing, and the ghastly final shootout, quote, they leaned against the door, someone fired a gun through the keyhole, a ball came through the door and struck Hiram in the face. Quote, they have not hurt Joseph or Hiram, Taylor told the tabernacle audience, but they have hurt themselves. They are damned and we shall see it. I know there are hundreds in this congregation who would have been glad to have been where we were, he said. I know Joseph and Hiram lived and died, men of God, and will live forevermore. <laughs> anyway, that's the end. Um, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Um, and I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope there's some questions. Um, if you do have questions, please move the microphone. Want to come up either, either way? Um, Could you talk a little bit more about what happened to the uh, reorganized church people that stayed on in Independence, Joseph Smith? Junior? The third, Joseph Smith the third. The third? Yeah. Well, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, <laughs> since they were very, they, they treated me really well. <laughs> the, so I'm really, really grateful to them. They invited me to come live in a house in Nauvoo, um, which was fantastic. So I lived there for a week. Um, yes. Um, that, I mean, that's, there was a genuine schism uh, over polygamy. And, um, in my book, not in my presentation, but in my book, it's Emma Smith is a really, really important person, Joseph's first wife. She's, she's the, really the female prophet. She's the sort of queen of Mormonism. And she's, she always hated polygamy. And she, absolutely, she, she bucked Brigham Young on, on everything. Um, and when Brigham took the saints to Utah, she stayed in Illinois. And, and that was the seed of the church because thousands of Mormons stayed with her. Um, I'm in, I'm in, since I didn't write a book about them, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I know that she stays in Illinois for a while, and I don't honestly know how the church relo relocated to Independence, which is not that far away. But I do know that I mean, Independence is the Zion that Joseph intended for his people to live. That church, um, yeah. are you a member of that church? Or? No, but I have friends who are. Right, right. It's, um, you know, it's, it, it kind of suffers in comparison, right, to the kind of muscular, broad-shouldered church that Brigham Young founded. Uh, they're not as rich, they're not as numerous, and um, they've kind of, they're, they're accused by Mormons of sort of becoming, you know, watery Protestants, really, uh, which is, of course, the ultimate <laughs> insult. But um, they, although I've been to a, 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 they're now called the Community of Christ, as you may well know, they, they even renamed themselves, and they, so they, they, they gave up the name Reformed Church of Latter-day Saints. And I don't know, they're, and, um, they, they believe, and if anyone wants to correct me, that's fine, um, you know, they believe the Book of Mormon to be true, um, but, but there's a lot that the, Utah, the Brighamites and the Utah Church accepts that they don't, that they don't accept. I, I, for instance, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm pretty confident, uh, for instance, you know, women um, can gain what's called the priesthood endowment in the community of Christ. And that's um, right, I mean, literally, literally right now, um, that's a huge deal in Salt Lake City, where, you know, women are, are not allowed inside the temple to get the, the priesthood rights. I mean, Mitt Romney is, a, is, every male Mormon is essentially a member of the Mormon priesthood, and no, no woman is. And there's a huge struggle now. Um, anyway, that, that was addressed years ago at the Community of Christ. I don't think it's a thriving religion, to be straight with you. Um, well, it's a really interesting topic. And this, is, this question is more about like your technique and like how you wrote the book. So I know you said that you started off basically with like zero knowledge, like from scratch, writing the book. And I mean, it's more of his, like his, his history history book than anything else did you choose to make it um like do historiography as opposed to like you know more fictional like 
I guess not fiction, but nonfiction, creative nonfiction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also, like when you were writing it, because obviously you chose to be a bit more detached from the characters. Um, how did you did you find yourself tempted to add personality to the characters by like inserting dialogue? And how did you choose like which I guess which quotes to add in? And did you think this gave one character more personality than it did i don't know another character in the book okay i think i can answer some of that thank you um uh yeah i mean it's a, it's a it's a work of, of popular history so i mean the best popular history I, I think is 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 readable factual accurate and interesting so so no there are <laughs> i'm not bob woodward there's no quotes that are made up here um period you know no it's it's um the, the quotes were all were all taken. There's no there's no fictional element whatsoever. I mean, curiously, this this story has been told more than once in fiction. It's never been told in nonfiction. But let me get to the second part of because, yeah, it was absolutely essential, I think, you know, to 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 make this a drama with with these with fascinating characters participating. You're kind of given you're given Joseph Smith for free. He, he's simply a, 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 a endlessly fascinating Shakespearean character, but um, but I mean there are other characters I discovered in the drama, um, you know the the unprincipled newspaper editor. And so in other words, there are, um, the pusillanimous governor whom I compare to Pontius Pilate, uh, the double dealing Captain Robert Smith. So um, yeah, I mean it, it was really important to me to find. Uh, Emma Smith is an amazing character, frankly. I mean, I, it was important to me to find maybe, I'd say there are like seven major actors in this book. And yeah, I wanted people to feel who they were and feel that they had a, a lifelike quality of some kind. But um, so that's how I would answer that. But I didn't, I didn't make up anything about them or I didn't, even, I didn't exaggerate their role uh, just because it was a pretty rollicking story going in. So we were like a country made up of many diverse religions. I mean, we had had experience with, with people of other faiths. What was it about Smith and the Mormons that was at the core? Was it, was it the polygamy? Or did they refuse to join in the rest of the community? Did they keep themselves so separate? People got suspicious. Were they unwilling to cooperate? What what, what made people so angry? That's a very good question. And I I didn't, you know, it's addressed in the book. It wasn't addressed in my presentation here. Um, All of those factors, and I'll I'll recapitulate, if you will. Um, And it's hard to know in what order to take them. But I chose, let's, let's, you know, and I'm not going to, rave on but to start with the religion i mean there is the there is the strangeness of the religion there's the heresy you know if you're a if you're a non-mormon there's the heresy that there's a new bible it's it's just a straight heresy period and so that divides the mormons from from every i guess it would be fair to say yes uh, you know every religious american of their time but there are other factors as well um politically they 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 were they, they made enemies uh, in both in both in Missouri and in Illinois because they voted as a block. So they controlled Hancock County where they had chosen to live, and that obviously made the pre-existing residents irate because due to the incredibly successful missionary efforts, specifically in England, this town, this colony, Nauvoo, was growing very very quickly. And so the Mormons quickly outnumbered the so-called, you know, the old settlers. They dominated the politics. It turns out if you dominate one county, you can have quite a bit of sway over politics in Illinois itself. There's even been a book written that I think is is poppycock, but that says that Smith was killed because of the because the Whigs were worried about the balance of the electoral college vote in 1844. I, I think that's totally ridiculous. However, the Mormons did have power in Illinois. They had political power, and people didn't like them for that. Um, you know, two other things. I mean, you, you, um, you know, the Mormons are are, um, are are insular. They're they're insular and or you know cohesive. Those are sort of two sides of the same coin. Economically, 
uh, they, they ticked a lot of people off because they became economically somewhat powerful. Uh, Mormons liked to do business with Mormons. They, they did not like to do business with non-Mormons. There were these allegations of cheating and theft, most of which probably weren't true, but the Mormons were sort of you know, easy targets for, and for less economically uh, cohesive and successful groups. Um, so yeah, and then uh, so uh, and so that led to a kind a kind of social ostracism. I think it's fair to say. So no, it, it's it, yeah, polygamy was sort of the um, ice, the icing on the cake, it, it, and it was a layered cake, which is frankly what you're saying. It was a cake with many layers, and, and polygamy was was fairly inflammatory for various reasons. But um, people, you know, uh, it's interesting in 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 the Pew study carried out a couple of years. You know, Mormons self-describe as, uh, as peculiar. They, they, they perceive themselves, even to this day, as strongly different from the men and women of other faiths. And that was simply true at this time as well. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, how did the Mormons receive your book? How did they perceive it? And the second one is, uh, would you know um, that, does the group in, in Salt Lake City still espouse polygamy, and if not, when they stopped? Right, right, right. Um, you know, I wrote a long, there's, there's all kinds of different Mormons. You know, there's liberal Mormons, there's formal Mormons, there's reformed Mormons, there's ex-Mormons, there's Mormon haters, there's deep dish uh, TBMs, as they call them, True Blue Mormons. The, the True Blue Mormons don't like this book, but that was to be anticipated for various reasons. But it's um, it's it's been it's been fairly well. It's only out in a week, so who knows? But it's you know, it's been fairly well received, frankly, uh, be, because I, I you could almost say for the wrong reasons because the Mormons have censored a great deal of their own history. Um, you know, they've kept polygamy out of this, the story of their own past up until maybe 30 or 40 years ago, which is a big mistake. It's a bad thing to hide. Um, so, so that answers sort of, I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic, frankly. I, I, I was at a Mormon reading group two nights ago. Um, you know, Mormon, <laughs> Mormons are incredibly intelligent. So, I mean, you know, half the people have read the book, all the questions are on. They're just genuinely interested. I would say, and I apologize. Tell me your, your second question. Second question had to do with um, polygamy is not legal in this country, and I wondered at what point or what the position. I know there are polygamous Mormons, but right, right, yeah, did the church are. in Salt, Salt Lake City take a stance right. against that, it? That was, yeah, yeah. That's, that's sort of part of this thing that I was attempting to describe. When the Mormons are in the outswing, when they're when they're at the when they they really realize that they've gone too far you know they want to be a state they want to participate in the united states because it's worth being part of it so and the one thing that's really keeping them from being a state of course is polygamy so in 1890 um uh the president wilford woodruff says uh polyg there will be no more polygamous marriages which is really tricky because th there's like hundreds of polygamous marriages in, that aren't you know that aren't um, done away with in any way. So what, what actually happens is that polygamy becomes outlawed in Utah. Oh, they become a state very quickly, 1893, I think, I think. But not until 1910, there's sort of a second declaration from the church saying, we really meant it about polygamy, <laughs> so stop it. And so that I, I have, I have somewhat akimbo views on this that I'm actually not going to share with you. But it, um, the, the LDS Salt Lake City Church uh, condemns polygamy wherever they see it, you know, period. But I'm just going to say two quick things. First of all, of course, we, we know through, through television, the, the Jeff's trial, whatever, you know, we, there are so-called fundamentalist Mormons. And now that you've heard my presentation, you see fundamentalist Mormons hearken back to Joseph Smith, to the fundamental teachings, the original teachings of the church, where Joseph said polygamy is in the Old Testament. So so-called these people that you see on TV, the fundamentalist Mormons with, with many wives, feel that they're the true 
followers of Joseph Smith, and they feel the people in Salt Lake City are the heretics. So I'm, you know, this gets complicated really quickly. The one thing I, d I sort of learned, that's a pretty grandiose term, but um, writing this book, I don't know, I, naturally I watched some episodes of the, um, there's an HBO series called Big Love, which has a guy named Bill Hendrickson, who's clearly a, uh, a sort of a, te a, a temple Mormon, he's a straight Mormon who's indulging in polygamy. And I, n naturally, I assumed that was just rubbish that HBO dreamed up, and it turns out it's not rubbish that HBO dreamed up. Um, that there are some uh, sort of, as they, we, you would say, temple recommend Mormons who, who are faithful to the, the Salt Lake Church who, who are polygamous, but, but certainly not openly, because not only is it illegal, but it's also condemned by the church. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You mentioned the uh, governor as Pontius Pilate, the Illinois governor. Uh, so that's one thing that comes up with the uh, title American Crucifixion. But w when did you think of that as being the title? At, at when you got started or as you developed the story? Um, it's kind of an interesting title. Yes, it is. It draws a lot of attention. Good, good. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll, you'll learn more about me than you wanted to know. There's some people here who already know more about me than they want to know. Anyway, so this, this guy, this, this editor said, you know, let's, let's see what we can do. But I had to write a proposal to the publishing house to get, to get the contract. And it was, it was hard, because I was starting from zero. I was learning things very quickly. And, and fairly early in the game, like in November of 2011 or something, this bizarre light bulb went off in my head. And I sent him an email saying, even if I don't end up writing this book, I'll give you something for free. I'll give you this title, American Crucifixion. Um, because I thought it was a terrific title. And um, yeah, OK, I did, I do, I, there's, a, there's a chapter called Enter Pontius Pilate, because this, this governor is a really messed up character who really does act like Pontius Pilate. But, um, you know, Smith himself, uh, I read you a passage where he compared himself to John, Paul, Peter, and Jesus himself. I mean, he, uh, he occasionally compared himself to Jesus. And um, fam famously and somewhat controversially, when he's called to Carthage to stand trial, he says, you know, I go as a lamb to the slaughter. He's used the metaphor of the lamb before in his own life. You know, as a serious holy person, I suppose it's, a, uh, it's an analogy that would not have escaped him. So, um, so I just sort of went with it. You know, I liked the title. Um, and, you know, something I haven't mentioned, but I, I can't think of another example, really, where a, a, you know, a, a person in America is, is killed for his or her re religious beliefs. So hmm. it seemed dramatic enough to me. It kind of leaves out Quakers, uh, the early ones anyway. Uh, I was reading, I think, uh, John Hay, Lincoln's secretary, grew up in a small town just south. And I had the impression from that that uh, as well as being uh, politically and economically together, they wanted to change the religious basis of the local area um, uh, to a theocracy. And that was one of the reasons why people didn't like it, and one of the reasons why your title is good. Are you reading the Tolliver biography of John Hay? Yeah, I, I can't remember which who wrote what I read. Are you uh, reading a recently published biography of John Hay? Yeah, a recently read. That's all I can. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's all I can claim. I don't. I don't. I don't mean to pick a fight with you, but that, I. I would say no. Actually, I, I write about this. This Hancock County wasn't really all that religious, although there's a lot of letters from, um, I don't you know, Methodist preachers or Congregationalist preachers complaining about Joseph Smith, calling him the devil, blah, 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 blah. But the, the, it, apparently it wasn't a very churchy part of the world. So that's not where the Mormons were making their, con their converts, really. So I, Hay, fascinatingly, yeah, future Secretary of State, uh, was a, he, he wrote a famous article about the killing of Joseph Smith, an event he did not witness. Um, because he's like eight years old, but um, go ahead. He was fully aware of all his all the adults heading he, north. His dad, John Hay's yeah. dad, was a doctor yeah. in the mob that went went to Carthage to kill Joseph. Um, so it's fast, and of course he's Lincoln's famous secretary in the movies. Hay and Nikolai are Lincoln's famous secretaries. Um, Lincoln sort of a, has a 
bizarrely tiny role in this book also. But um, yeah, and Hay was a Warsaw Signal delivery boy, so he delivered the anti-Mormon newspaper. And, but I respectfully uh, d disagree. I, I don't think, I don't think that, oddly, they weren't really proselytizing. I, just, yeah. I, I yeah. wasn't a strong position. I just was Sorry, thinking, yeah. But I do, I do have another question, and this is you know, really random. Uh, I, have a, I have a family genealogical interest in the descendants of uh, Job Tyler, and there are three Tylers that, that intersect uh, with this story. One starts with Comfort Tyler in, in the Syracuse area, at one end of Onondaga. I like to think of Tom Myra as being at the right. other end. Was, I think, probably the best known Mason in the area at the time. Okay. Uh, the second one was Dan Tyler, who became a Union general, went with uh, Sidney Johnston to uh, at, at Buchanan's orders uh, to uh, put to, it end to, to the, Utah. To right. put it in, put an end to the to right. the the Mormon heresies, and <clears throat> another Dan who actually grew up also near Onondaga, but by that time had written the Mormon Battalion in the Mexican War. Right. Uh, and I'm wondering if you had heard of these of, of the Tylers, and if you had, did the two Dans meet, and did they meet just east of? I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna let you down a second time. Yeah. Sorry, I don't I don't know the Tylers. I, I just leave it at that. Let's get this guy. Wait, wait, wait. This Alex, last when, question. Uh, okay, great. It's like a press conference. Too when much. Smith went back, <laughs> did he go back thinking I can talk my way out of this, or did he go back thinking I'm going to be martyred, but this is what I need to do to promote the religion forever now you mean when Smith tries to escape yeah. what is he thinking when he goes back yeah. okay um, Jack is referring uh, to this strange sort of rowboat crossing of the Mississippi or, or around June 20th where Joseph is clear it, it's very biblical Joseph is clearly trying to escape he he, want, he wants this cup to pass from him and it's actually um, Emma, his wife, sends a letter across the Mississippi, and and she basically says, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. He's lit out for the territory uh, to be totally crass. I mean, he's lift, he's saving his own skin. His wife, his you know, his only wife of of X years, um, says, you know, you've left us here, and we're going to get killed by by these mobs of Mormon haters, these these fake militia armies, and because it it it, it was a charismatic theocracy, the, the whole thing depended on Joseph. There, there, there's a, there's the there's the patina of law and rule and this, but it's all coming from Joseph. And so, without him, the Mormons are naked and vulnerable. And and she says, you know, we're all going to die. You know, you brought it's it's. It's very, you know, you brought, she's essentially saying 3,000 people sailed the Atlantic from England to come here and believe in you and believe in your Bible, and you're in a rowboat crossing the Mississippi, and you're going to go hide in the Rockies. So he, he's sort of shamed. I, I'm, not, I'm not totally answering your question, but, but given the last question, of course I will. I mean, um, I don't know. I, there's really con, uh, conflicting evidence. You know, it would be more biblical. And of course, the Mormons controlled their own history for a long time. It would be more biblical, of course, if he did know that he was going to his own death, that, that if the martyrdom was a predestined event. But there's, you, you can't really say that. Uh, he does say some things because he's intelligent. I mean, you know, another thing that his, it gets lost. Uh, he's an intelligent person. He fully is aware of the dangers of going to Carthage. And he vocalizes those, and he says, we may well die. On the other hand, he meets people on the day, two days, the same day before he's killed. I mean, his, his, the very last act is that he's, he's sending a letter, in, <laughs> essentially, to the Clarence Darrow of, the, of Illinois. He's sending a letter to the absolutely best lawyer in Illinois saying, get me out of here. And this had always worked for him. He had, he had very excellent contacts in the legal profession. So he, he had a reasonable reasonable expectation that he would get sprung from jail as he had been sprung before. So there you go. I'm not sure he knew. Anyway, thank you so much.